So hi everyone again. Like I said, my name is Rebecca. I'm a product manager here at Brating Tech. Uh, we'll just get started and do a quick company introduction while um, some people are maybe a little bit late joining onto the Zoom. So today I'm joined by Dr. Rana Fatit, who is a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in the UK. And today she's going to be talking us through some tips and tricks for IPSC to um, ESC, the oligodendrocyte um, culture. And Rana is a wealth of expert in this area. So I'm really excited um, for you guys to learn from her. So quite quickly, I'll just have a brief company introduction. So Protein Tech is a leading life science reagent company. And we have products which comprise across three core brands. So through our Protein Tech brand, we sell our antibodies and immunoassays. So these are predominantly antibodies against 13,000 human targets. We actually have the largest coverage of in-house made um, antibodies against two thirds of the human proteome, which is um, the most in any of the antibody industry. We also have over 400 ELISA kits, as well as our flexible antibody labeling kits. And then through our humankind brand, we sell our recombinant cytokines and growth factors. And these are um, HEC293 Express, so that's a human cell line. And that means they have native human um, folding, post-translation modifications and glycosylation. And this actually leads to better bioactivity as well as um, they don't have any tags and they don't have any endotoxins. So they're really good for RUO and also for GMP grade. And then through our Kurumatec brand, we sell our nanobody based reagents. And these are really, um, as the name suggests, they're smaller um, binding molecules, they're called nanobodies. And these are excellent for immunoprecipitation of tag protein. So for example, GFP, as well as um, super resolution microscopy due to their smaller size. So today we are, um, this lecture will be led by um, Rana. So Dr. Fatit is a postdoc fellow at the Institute for Regeneration at the University of Edinburgh. Her previous research has investigated how large genetic de deletions and duplication contribute to neurodevelopmental disorders, specifically using cerebral organoids. And some of you might remember Rana, as she has also led a few other workshops for us, including her Cerebral Organoids workshop, which I believe she did two years ago, which was excellent. Um, and now she is working on human-derived embryonic stem cells using, and transcriptomic data, looking at the remyelination in neurodegeneration disorders, specifically multiple sclerosis. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand over to Rana, and I can't wait for you guys to learn from her. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. And right. Can everyone see? Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Right. So I'm Rana and today I'll be talking about um, how to differentiate iPSCs and ESCs, human embryonic stem cells, to give oligodendrocytes. Now, just a quick overview about oligodendrocytes. They are the special myelin producing cells and they provide metabolic support to neurons. They arise from oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And as they differentiate, they express a lot of different markers, some of which are maintained throughout that period and others are just specific to certain stages of their differentiation. Now, there are certain instances where you would, um, the, an insult to the um, the mature oligodendrocyte or the myelin or both would result in remyelination. But luckily, as adults, we have um, an adult oligodendrocyte progenitor pool, which can actually differentiate upon such insults and um, induce remyelination, which makes oligodendrocytes such a an interesting, you know, um, an interesting cell to work with in the uh, field of neurodegeneration and dream myelination. So there are several established protocols for differentiating oligodendrocytes. There are two main ones that we've used in our labs, and largely they follow the same pattern. You start with your HESCs or IPSCs, you neuralize them to give you neuroprogenitor cells, then you start patterning them with different morphogens at different concentrations until you have OPCs, which are the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And from there, you start differentiating them into oligodendrocytes. Now, the two main particles that 
we've used in our lab are more or less very similar in, in terms of what um, supplements and reagents do you use. However, they differ largely in how these cells um, are formed in, in the sense that most of the first one here to the left, the cells are in suspension. And on the uh, one to the right, most of the cells are actually adherent either to matrigel or poly l or nithin. And there is only a very few section where you actually lift those cells and you suspend them. And for today, I'll be mostly focusing on that AIM protocol where you, your cells are mostly in suspension, apart from two checkpoints over here where they are adherent. So the first part is solving and maintaining your IPSCs or ESCs. So the way we do it is we coat our six well plates with laminin and you coat as many wells as many vials you're going to solve. Um, you get the, you retrieve your vial and you put them in a water bath for 30 seconds and then you gently resuspend them. And the reason you do it gently is because you want to keep the cells as clumped as possible so that they can form colonies um, better and quicker. You centrifuge it at very low speeds and then you resuspend it in the media of choice and rock inhibitor. And they would look something like that at day two, day three, and at day four, they can become very confluent and ready to split. Now, this differs from cell line to cell line, and the recovery and viability of the cell might um, be different according to the line that you use. Um, things that you should consider is the kind of media that you're using. If your cells are used to that kind of media, sometimes if they're not very happy, you might want to experiment with different medias or just, you know, making a, a mix of different medias that, you know, can support the cells better. It also depends on how long you passage them for. So some cells uh, need a longer time to recover. So you'd have to split them a couple of times before they are more viable and, you know, grow at a good rate. And also the split ratio is something that you should consider as in one well of cells, you would split it into how many wells of cells and that depends on the confluency and how the cells really look like and the rate of differentiation that you see in your wells. Now, once your cells are ready and they're confluent, this is the first part of your actual oligodendrocyte differentiation protocol. You want to lift them and form the, the, the neurospheres in the suspension. So you treat the wells with acutase for five minutes and then using your P1000, you try and blast them vigorously. And the reason is you want to actually create a cell suspension. So you blast the cells vigorously and then you transfer them into the centrifuge. You can also do a wash step just to make sure that you've collected all the cells in your wells. You centrifuge it again at low speed, 300 Gs for three minutes and you're resuspended in your media of choice with rock inhibitor. And we've found that when you do not add rock inhibitor, the spheres do not form very well. And what we use is something called agri-well plates. <clears throat> now, there are different ways. Some, some people just put it into 10 centimeter dishes and aggregates would form. But we found that using agri-well plates um, have made this a lot easier. And they basically look like that. They've got little um, whales. And with the, every whale contains like little um, squares where the cells can actually, it helps the cells settle and it helps the cells form the spheres. So you get more uniform spheres and you get a lot more um, spheres than you would do <clears throat> by just simply putting the, um, the cells in a 10 centimeter dish. Um, and then you just centrifuge that plate, you leave it in the incubator and your spheres the next day would have actually formed and they would look very nice and uniform like this one. And what you need to do um, next is to basically lift those spheres off your agrowell. So you would remove the old media, which would contain some debris, and you add your neuralization media, which would contain your active inhibitor and LDN. Um, and, you add, and basically use um, 200 P200 picking tips. And they're exactly like the regular tips, but you've cut really the tip so that it's a bit wider, so that you don't really damage the spheres as you're picking up. And what you do is similar to the previous blasting technique where you just, you know, blow with the media at the whales and then the cells and um, the spheres would, uh, would rise up and then you would collect that and put it back into your plate and you incubate them on the shaker. They would look something like this. Oops. Um, but sometimes um, the neurospheres don't form very well and you would end up with something that looks like this. So it looks like they're trying to aggregate, they're trying to form the spheres, but they don't look very good. And when you lift them, 
you don't get big spheres, you don't get round and uniform looking spheres. So there are ways to troubleshoot and to get around that. So the first thing to consider is, again, the media. You might want to um, avoid changing the media right away or by um, or as you lift them, you might want to keep them in the original media before changing it to the neuralization media. And that helps transition the spheres and the cells better and doesn't give them like sort of a shock. And um, sometimes the, where that, the reason spheres um, do not form is because the cells have been lifted too early. So they, you might want to passage them for a few more times so that they would recover more after you've sawn them. And then you start your lifting stage. And finally, it could be the plate you're using or the size. So we usually lift them into, after using the agrolols, into um, the 10 centimeter dishes. But sometimes the cells just like to cuddle up a little bit more. So it might be better to use smaller size dishes um, or plates. So these are the things that you might want to experiment with um, when you're lifting the cells if your spheres are not forming very well. Now, from then on, the neuralization and patterning starts um, and the spheres would gradually grow in size. As you can see here at day four to day 14, they would become bigger, darker and more rounded and uniform. And by day 10, you would start adding your morphogens and your um, supplements to your media. So this is where you start adding things like FGF. And we've actually used um, the humankind um, FGF and it works well in our protocol and in our hands. You start adding retinolic acid and heparin. Um, and then you keep maintaining the cells, changing the media um, three times weekly. And we usually do it on like Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Um, and then there is a stage where you need to confirm the the neural stem identity of your cells. So you do a morphology check. And this is the first checkpoint where you do it actually on an adherent, um, an adherent platform. So you would coat again your whales with laminum, one uh, whale per one dish that you have from the spheres. And you simply pick the spheres, put them onto the whales, leave them overnight and have a look the next day. And what you're really looking for are these processes that are spreading out from the spheres they're flat they're stretchy and they're not showing any signs of spotty nuclei and when you uh when that's something that you actually see then you know that okay your cells are growing fine they are a neural stem identity is confirmed and then you can move on with your um um protocol so to lift these cells from, because now they're stuck in the plate so you want to actually lift them and return them into um the suspension so what you do is to detach them um, and we use a scraper that to basically scrape the cells off um, and the spheres would gently, you gently like move them or scoop them and then they would just come off. And then you'd simply transfer them into the dish with their appropriate media, with the appropriate ingredients, again, FGF, retinoic acid, pyromorphamine, and that depends on the kind of protocol that you're using. The concentration might differ from one lab to the other. And then you start the patterning phase and at this phase the cells are very big and you just change the media twice um, a week. You swirl simply the plate so that all the spheres kind of are kind of collected into the middle and you just simply remove uh, some of the media and add some of the fresh media. Um, and again you just keep maintaining them for um, until day 30. And by day 30, they would look something like really big. You can actually tell from the media that it starts looking yellowish more quicker. So they are kind of very metabolically active as well. Um, so the next thing you want to do when they become very big is to chop them. Um, so we simply use a razor. Uh, and you collect them again, you swirl the plate, collect the spheres towards the middle, use the razor to chop them, and that autoclave blade, um, to make sure the, the, the blade is autoclaved first, of course, um, and then once you have chopped them, and there is no concern about over chopping them, if you chop them too much, that's still fine, but you just want to make sure that they don't get too big, because when they get too big, they might not live very well, and they might increase the chances of cell death. So what you then do is to transfer them to 15, uh, to 15 ml Falcon centrifuge and you incubate them in your media of choice with DNAs. And at this point, the media we were using included these supplements, FGF, PGGFA, Premorphamine, IGF and Sonic Agonists. And all of these help towards patterning your neutrospheres towards oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. Um, so from then on, you're basically expanding your um, OPC pool. 
and you maintain them on the shaker for one week. And then once they are there for a week, you start dissociating them. Basically, you want to create a cell suspension and you coat them on plates. These can be six well plates or 24 well plates. And they're coated with um, poly L ornithine. And in our lab, we also coat them with fibrodectin, laminin, and metrogel. And then once you seed your um, cells into the plates, you will decide whether you want to keep them as oligodendrocytes and or you want to differentiate them into oligo... Sorry, uh, if you want to keep them as oligodendrocyte progenitors or differentiate them into oligodendrocytes. And that depends on the kind of media that you're going to use. Either you'll keep them in the OPC media or you would add a different... You would uh, use a differentiation media, which includes IGF, T3 and ITS. And all of these are insulin-based supplements that help and promote the differentiation of OPCs into oligodendrocytes. And from there, you basically have your um, oligodendrocytes and they should be ready for use. So there are several applications that you can um, use them for. And that depends on your research question, really, and what you're looking for. So you can do immunofluorescence in them. You can stain them for your certain markers. You can analyze them by flow cytometry. Um, you can sort a specific subtype and then do further downstream processing on them. You can co-culture them with other cell types that could be neurons. Um, and then you can also transplant them into immunocompromised myelin deficient mice to create some sort of chimeras that you can actually investigate how they further differentiate in vivo. Um, and this is what I'll show you. I'll show you some of the um, transplants that we have done. So what you do is you basically grow, your, you follow the protocol, you grow your cells until they are reach the OPC stage. And they are, instead of plating them down into um, plates, what you need to do is to just dissociate them and then you inject your uh, cells into the shiver, the corpus callosum of your shiver rag mice at very early time points. That would be around P2 to P4. And then you maintain these mice for six weeks. You can also, of course, take them at an earlier time point. And then you retrieve their brain tissue, and then you can do um, all sorts of analysis from there. You can also analyze that using flow cytometry or do some immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence to, to see how they differentiate. And what we've done in the lab, because we're really interested in the different oligodendrocyte subtypes, so we have stained them with markers for like opalin, which is one oligodendrocyte subtype, and you've seen them for olig2, and this was um, a pre the, an antibody that we've used from protein tech as well. Um, and with that, you see like opalin here in blue, which looks very nice. And also you see that the cells that you've transplanted are all positive for oligg2, which kind of confirms that, oh, they are actually oligodendrocytes and they're expressing the oligodendrocytic markers. We've also tried other antibodies, such as RBFOX1 and human nuclear antigen. So the cells we've used are actually GFP positive. They express GFP, which kind of makes it easier when you're looking under the microscope to actually look for green and, okay, and then focus on that area. So we've stayed here with human nuclear antigen because they're human derived. So they will also be positive for HUNA. And we stained it for another marker, which is RBFOX1, which is also another subtype that we are interested in in our lab. And as you can see here, the green cells are also expressing red, which is RBFOX1, and are also expressing the human nuclear antigen. So we know that, okay, this marker is expressed and it's co-expressed with the hu uh, human nuclear antigen. So it's, it's very nice. It looks really nice. And then you can use that or adapt these techniques for different things that you use in the lab. We also looked into another um, 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 protein, which is Spark, which is also another subtype you're interested in. And again, you can see that they, um, the green cells are expressing human nuclear antigen, and Spark is also expressed in the corpus callosum of these um, shiver rag mice. Um, and that's me for today. I'm happy to answer any questions and discuss anything in details. And I would like to acknowledge the lab and all the facilities at the IIR for um, allowing us to do this amazing work. Thank you. Thanks, Rana. That was really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's a few questions coming in. But before we get to those, I have a really quick, um, just a couple of products to present, and then we will get to the questions um, for Rana. So I will share my screen again. So at Protein Tech, we also sell our range of human recombinant, recombinant sorry, proteins. 
And these are under our humankind brand. And these, as I said before, they are all expressed in um, human cells, so HEC203 cells. This means they have native human confirmation and also native post-translation modification, which means that they have much higher bioactivity. And they're also animal component free, tag free, carrier free and endotoxin free, which is um, really um, impressive in this market at really competitive price. Because unlike cell um, proteins that are expressed by things like insect cells or bacterial cells, you don't have um, the native machinery in order to generate the correct post-translation modifications. Um, and also in order for them to have the correct kind of like dimerization as well. So um, that's why it's really important um, for you to choose the best quality set, um, proteins for your um, IPSCs, for example. So as well as our, um, so in terms of what we offer for oligodendrocytes, we offer FGF2 or FGF basic, it's the same thing, IGF1, um, PDGF A, BDNF, GDNF and HDF. And these are all, like I said, the research use only that will very competitively priced alongside competitors but they have um, superior quality due to the fact that they have been expressed in um, a human cell line so as well as our cells are um our recombinant proteins sorry we also sell our antibodies so these are things like um the being able to look at the differentiation of your cells looking at the different markers so in terms of the oligodendrocyte markers that we sell we've got olig2 and rb fox1 which um Rana showed in her own data really beautifully. Thank you, Rana. Um, as well as myelin basic protein, PAX3 and SBARC. If you're interested in trying any of our humankind proteins, we can offer you a two microgram free sample of EGNF, FGF2, EGF or um, these two as well. Um, feel free to scan the QR code here, but also we will be sending out a link to the same form. Um, with that, I will um, move on to the questions. So thank you so much for sending in the questions. Um, if anyone has any questions now, please do write them in. Um, so uh, one is from Jessica Tillman, and she is asking if it is possible to, sorry, it's moving. <laughs> um, is it possible to freeze the cells at any of the stages, for example, the APCs, and then would they be viable still when you thaw them? Uh, yes, you could actually freeze them when they are at the sphere stage, at the OPC stage. So once you, they reach OPCs, you can freeze them. And um, we personally like to parry through and just like do our set of analyses because when you um when you start when they get too big and you start chopping them, it's advised that you just chop them for three times and not longer, more than that. So and you chop them like every two weeks, so you can keep them as an OPC stage for up to like um four weeks or six weeks and after that I would chuck them away and start again um but yes you can freeze them at the sphere stage when they are OPCs and then you could start again um um yeah then you basically just thaw them in the media that they were in before um and then another question is um have you ever tried to induce OPC differentiation from IPC by bypassing the NPC stage. Yeah, we haven't done that at the moment, but we are considering using some other alternative microbiology approaches to just direct their differentiation towards certain um, subtypes of interest, but we haven't done that yet in the lab, no. And another sort of um, direct differentiation question is, have you ever tried going from direct cellular reprogramming from somatic cells to APCs? And do you have an opinion on this? Cellular reprogramming, you mean starting from um, just a regular um, skin cell or biopsy and then reprogramming them into iPSCs? Um, I'll, I mean, no, not... to OPCs. To OPCs. So I, imagine, I wondered if you'd have to go back to the, yeah. Yeah, you'll probably have to start like to to direct to change them into um OPs to reprogram them into IPSCs first and then differentiate them. I don't see why that's not feasible. It can definitely it depends on your starting um cell line. So if you're starting with a you know a patient biopsy for example or something, and you want to investigate you know certain OPCs function in that uh, context. So yeah, it's definitely something that you can do. And then once you reach the IPSC stage, once your line is stable, you can definitely start. Um, differentiating them towards all the good yeah. sites. Um, and then another question sort of about like the length of the protocol is um, it's a very typical challenge that this um, IPSC to oligodendrocyte um, maturation takes a really long time. Um, yeah. How long does it take for you 
Um, and also, are there any ways to shorten the protocol? So for us, it takes around three months. <laughs> it's from starting to fill the cells until you actually get all the good dendrocytes, and then you can actually do, um, you know, follow up, you know, investigations and that. Um, there are other alternative protocols, but I that we have um come across, but I don't think the differentiation might be very um like you'd need to try it to see if that shorter protocol would give you a higher yield of oligodendrocytes as well. Um, but for us, no, we've stuck with the um the the longer one because we are confident in the 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 yield that we get from just maintaining them for this long and giving them the time to mature in vitro. Um, and then there's a, a few questions um, about what is the purity of your APSCs and oligodendrocytes at your different time points? Well, you would definitely, like when you plate them down, you definitely get some um, astrocytes, you definitely get some other cell types. Um, I remember um, some people in the lab have quantified that, but I don't remember the number on top of my head, but I can get in touch with you and give you like some, some details. But they would largely, there was like a very large population of our cultures where um, oligodendrocytes and OPCs. So yeah, mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact number, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. And then um, I think we still have time for a few more questions, if that's okay, Rana. Yeah, of course. There's lots there's coming lots. in, which is great. Um, so one of them is like, I think, just a general question about um, oligodendrocyte cultures in general. Is it can they be, um, is it can they myelinate neurons in cold cultures? So kind of doing what they... Um, so that's a really good question. There have been reports of co-culturing them and, my, and, and you know, show the paper showing that there is a myelination in vitro. Uh, we are working on that at the moment in our lab. We're trying to grow them with different um, uh, interneurons and we're trying to see how um, that, ha like whether that occurs or not. So I, I'm in our hands, we're so, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> um. And then there's another question asking, um, have you ever tried to reach mature OL stage, um, such as MVP, MOG, in 2D culture? In 2D culture, no, they would not really produce, like you wouldn't get a lot of myelin in the, in just on their own in the culture. You would have to, like mm -hmm. when you transplant them into the chimeras, for example, yes, you would see the expression of MVP, you would see the expression of more mature because they have a, a better niche, a better environment to mature. But um, in the culture, in 2D in vitro cultures, I they lack the essential cues to to go to towards that mature step they would express markers like o4 um olig2 um but yeah but they wouldn't go as far as you know producing myelin or becoming super mature in that sense um and then just a couple more questions if this is okay um one of them is um he says he might have missed it but how do you get single cells from the spinal cell? how do you get what, single sorry? cells <laughs> How do you get single cells from the final sphere? Right. So there are different ways to go about that. Some there there is a common some people commonly use acutase where you would just like um resist, like use acutase treatment and then create a single cell suspension. But with acutase you would get a very high cell death. So so it's not the best way. So in our hands we use the Worthington dissociation protocol, which is a papane based dissociation system. It takes a bit longer than acutase, but you get a better yield towards the end. Um yeah, so it so we'd follow the papine dissociation system. I guess that is important after three months of work <laughs> to get these. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then one more question is, um, um, someone is saying that during their experiments, they have a lot of cell death during reprogramming and what recommendations do you have to prevent this? Um, so during reprogramming, as in changing them from somatic cells to stem cells, is that the what you mean? I, that's all they've said right um i mean in general it depends on like if you have cell like increase in cell death and maybe look into the kind of 
um, treatments they use, as in how harsh are these treatments on the sales, um, the, the how vigorous are you resuspending the sales, maybe try and optimize the protocol as in the duration of how long you would keep them um, in the different stages. Um, but I would need more details to help you with the optimization as in what exactly are you looking for or where exactly is that sale death coming from? So I really, I need more details. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, and then I guess one question is, are you able to produce different types of oligodendrocytes from different regions of the brain? Um, so in culture, we have found that, um, so we've looked into different markers um, from the reported papers, and we found that in culture, they they do not express one specific type. They they lack the extensive cues. So they would you would have um, oligodendrocytes, but they're not really a specific, and I think that subtype, because I think it's just about um, how further along the maturation line are they at that time point. So, yeah. Um, and then I guess one last question, which some other people might be thinking is someone's asking for a written protocol. So perhaps when we send out the um, follow up email, are there any um, sort of general publications that you're following that we can send these so people they for, are the for the two, written protocol? Yeah, yeah, there are the two main ones that I've cited in the paper. So the both of protocols are published. The one that had the adherent, the majority of the where the majority of the protocol was in adherent culture and the other one, which I've described here, the one that is in suspension. And yeah, so the two papers I've cited in the presentation are the ones you can have a look at. OK, great. And are we are you OK if we send these slides to everyone? Of course, yeah. Okay, so yeah, everyone will be able to get the slides, get the recording, and then the the essentially the the papers with the protocols are, will be in those slides. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for your attendance. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate everyone showing up, and um, thank you so much to Rana for a really um, educational talk, and hopefully it will be able to benefit some people. So, yeah. Um, hope we see you all again soon and yeah big thanks again to Rana and um, enjoy the rest of your day bye thank you bye bye